COVID-19 coronavirus. Now, to get you caught up on where things stand right now, here's what we know. There are now three confirmed cases of the virus in Maryland. Two of them are a married couple in their 70s. The other is a 50-year-old woman with no relation to the couple. All three returned to Maryland on February 20th after traveling overseas. They were on a cruise ship, and officials tell us, not, well, tell not that where they are traveling, though. They have not told us exactly where they went, but right now they are in good condition. They are in quarantine at their homes, and they are in Montgomery County. That cruise ship never even docked in Baltimore. Now, worldwide, there are more than 100,000 cases, the vast majority in mainland China. Around the world, 3,408 people have died so far related to the coronavirus. Here in the United States, we have 236 cases right now. 14 deaths, all but one in Washington state with an additional death in California. And we know many of you, our viewers, have questions. Joining me now is Dr. Theodore Bailey or Ted Bailey, Chief of Infectious Diseases from GBMC, to talk through your concerns. Thank you so much for joining us. Of course. I want to make sure that we invite everyone out there right now watching us on Facebook that if you want to post any questions, let us know what you're thinking about, and we will try and get through each one of those questions as, as soon as possible and try and get through them. Even if you did not hear it, repeat that question so we'll try and get to it as, as quickly as possible. Well, right now I want to ask you the first question. What is a coronavirus? So a coronavirus is a family of viruses. There's several different variations of it, and there's uh, some historical examples that are, we can talk about later. But it's a virus that we're capable of transmitting, through respiratory routes, therefore acquiring it by breathing it in or getting onto our mucous membranes. And coronaviruses in general are capable of causing anything from a, an asymptomatic infection, where no one has any symptoms at all, to something that's life-threatening. In this case, we've seen some examples of that. And uh, so when we're talking about coronaviruses, there, uh, we know of at least seven right now, right? Is that uh, this, this uh, coronavirus, the COVID-19 is what mm -hmm. it's being officially named as, is similar to is something that went through in the family with SARS, MERS, and then there's four others, though, that are out there. And it's a virus that came from an animal and is now impacting humans. That's correct. So yeah. even with the, the two specific ones that you mentioned, MERS yes. and SARS-1. SARS-1 was an epidemic in 2003. MERS was a, a more recent epidemic that we still see cases of now and then. Mm -hmm. um, in these cases, those are the most severe versions of the coronaviruses. The other ones that you mentioned, there's a number of them that don't make the news because they cause the common cold. Right. They're, they're one of the causes of the common cold, and so we know those symptoms pretty well. And when people hear that, though, and you see hear about the symptoms, you, you're not really sure, like, oh, wait a minute, this is a coronavirus. Well, the coronaviruses, as you just said, have been out for a while. In fact, if you get some medical information right now, it may say that you have been infected with the coronavirus, but it's not the COVID-19 one that everyone's so concerned about. But you may see that on some paperwork. In fact, for kids, they may see it there. And it's just saying, this is what the common cold you have. We at least have this information on that. That's right. And okay. I'll even be a little more clear, because as people are reading, and I'm sure if anybody's tuning in right now, they're also reading, mm -hmm. um, is that the COVID-19 is the actual disease caused by this current coronavirus. And the name for the new coronavirus is the SARS-CoV-2, which references that it's like the SARS-1 from 2003. So a lot more explanations right there. And when we hear, first hear about this, how does this, though, break down, okay, we hear SARS and MERS and the, um, the SARS-CoV-2, mm -hmm. as you were just saying. Kind of tell us, what, what does that mean, like with the different strains that are there? Yeah, so... I'll take you back to the 2003 SARS-1 epidemic. This started also in China, mm -hmm. and, and we believe these are coming from animals, often hybrid viruses where the precursor virus started off in animals, came together with another virus that then enabled it to make the species jump into humans, and we see these linked to markets in China where there's a lot of direct human-to-animal exposure and a lot of animal-to-animal -animal exposure. Right. So in, in the SARS outbreak, we saw roughly 8,000 cases worldwide. Started in China, but did spread worldwide. Um, it happened in November of 2002, and it really continued on until the summer of 2003. Okay. Saw about 8,000 cases, and there was about one out of 10 of those cases that ended in death. And so let's talk a little bit more than the symptoms here that we're seeing right mm -hmm. now with coronavirus, 2019 coronavirus, or COVID-19. Well, it, which is the same thing. It, it's the disease right. and the virus. It's like there's HIV and there's AIDS. There's the virus and the disease. So the symptoms that we're seeing that are a common denominator to most of the cases are going to be fever. We see that in 95 or more percent of the cases. So very common. That's different from the common cold. The common cold gives us the snuffles, um, but does not give us fevers typically. Okay. But it is a little bit more like the flu, which is respiratory symptoms plus a fever. Okay, so then if we, say if we do have a, uh, another illness right now, a, a common cold from something else, and we get, are worried about getting the COVID-19, will that then 
put us on an exponential level of um, you know danger, I guess? Or can you do both of them at the same time, a viral and bacterial? Well, they're both viral. Yep. I mean, so just to be clear, the, the cold that you're talking about plus COVID, those are both viral. And the, the, the cold itself is really an upper respiratory thing. So we're talking about something that gives us a runny nose, a sore throat, um, not so much of a lower airway. We may have a cough, but it's this upper airway okay. cough. Um, and it's not going to be something that should it complicate uh, or put someone at higher risk for okay. COVID-19. COVID-19 is a lower airway. It gets to the lungs, and that's really where we exchange air and, and really absorb our air. Um, and so that's a much more dangerous place to have an infection. That's why we do see some severe cases, although it's important to note most are still mild. Right. Most are mild. And then let's talk about asthmatics, though. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you're talking about respiratory, right, isn't that all about the breathing? So, you know, people with asthma or COPD is another way of having this, this kind of airway problem. Their airways are really overreactive uh, to inflammation. They tend to tighten up and so that the air entry is... is much more difficult for them, those people are more at risk of a severe version of the infection. One of the things we've seen when we talk about the, the case fatality rate, how deadly this virus is, if we would take everyone all together, we're seeing a rate around 2%, uh, somewhere above 2% being how many cases lead right. to death. But when we take groups with other health issues, whether it's heart disease, and in your case, lung disease, COPD or asthma, right. we see that rate more up in the 5 or 6% rate. Okay. Doctor, we are also getting some questions from our Facebook page. Uh, I'm just hearing right now that a lot of people right now are worried about traveling because we hear, even as we just heard from Dr. Gales from um, Maryland here, he was just talking about the anxieties that are involved with this, but he said all of these cases that we have, and the three here in Maryland, have been travel-related in our state. Nothing has been community transmission. So, But we have some viewers right now that are asking, okay, well, can I travel then? Should I cancel my trans travel plans or cruise ships, Bahamas, maybe to Italy? Well, it seems to be more contagious than some of the earlier coronaviruses. And uh, we have seen associations with cruising. And with being on a cruise, you're actually in an environment, a fixed, closed environment, for a much longer period of time. Um, that particular mode of transport does seem to, to pose risks. If, um, in the cases of the Diamond Princess, that's the right. one that was uh, quarantined off Japan, you know, we saw it, probably asymptomatic individuals getting on um, and, then it, and then it's spreading among a confined population. Okay, and, and then it's all about age too, and I wanna talk about the elderly here in just a second, but we also had another question, somebody was just asking about, what about kids? Kids in schools, and a lot of parents are worried about this, even though we are hearing the ages are much higher, and that the pediatricians are saying, you know what, it's really not impacting your kids, but still, school-wise, now we have products. We have people talking about masks, and we'll talk about that also, but let's talk about some products. Spraying something on, sanitizer or wipes, do they help to try and fight COVID-19? Yes, they do. So I emphasize that it's respiratory. And, and the first picture that someone might get is from my lungs right to yours. Yeah. And that's some part of it. But we also know that the virus then also lands out onto the environment and can persist there, um, sometimes for several days without appropriate cleaning. But we know that appropriate cleaning is highly effective about it. This was studied in a Singapore outbreak in a hospital setting where they had control. Mm -hmm. They were able to test the environment in rooms where people had confirmed cases. They were able to test it before cleaning and actually detect it on surfaces, and then they were able to do their standard hospital cleaning, which is typically with alcohol-based cleaning, sure. and they could not detect it anymore. So it does get into the environment, it can be on objects, but it is something that you can clean off of objects, but also it brings up the most important point. It's, it's about hand washing, really relentless hand washing, and you've got some products here, uh, alcohol-based uh, antiseptic uh, scrubs, or soap and water. Either one of those are gonna be very good at eliminating it and, and avoiding touching our faces. Let's talk about how long they last on the, sim uh, on this, these, um, the actual virus will stay on a surface though. If we wipe a desk, do we have any idea right now about this coronavirus, how long that will last on a surface? We don't know for this particular one, but okay. during the SARS-1 outbreak, it was, an, it, was, it was raised as a question again, and using viruses that were similar to it, felt to be a model for it, we could detect it for several days. Okay. Uh, with the right humidity, the right temperature. So if somebody has is infected, they cough, they put something, a, a, a droplet onto this surface, I touch it, in order for me to actually get sick, it's on my hands right now, in mm. order for me to actually get it, I would have to either touch my mouth, my nose, my eyes, um, in order to get that product, or to eat something with this hand that is also has it, and that droplet would then go into my system. That's, that's correct. Okay. And that's why the, the, the last resort, the sort of the last barrier, which is an, an imposing barrier, it's a powerful barrier for us to use, is hand washing. Right. You know, keeping these, these kinds of products around us at all times and using them um, is key. All right, so then when we're talking about this, okay, now I'm worried that somebody in my family may have similar symptoms, they have the fever, they have almost flu-like conditions. When do I contact my physician or my provider? For me right now, that's, are you feeling ill? 
you know, the, the, because the other viruses that cause these same symptoms, these would also be things we wouldn't want to spread to our loved ones. So there's nothing about having the symptoms this year as opposed to other years that would lead us to do something different apart from good hygiene. Mm -hmm. Our family members should be washing their hands. We should be covering our cough. You know, we should not be going to work when we're quite sick. And what you just did right there is what, something that we're telling our kids all the time. Cough into your elbow, not your paw, right? I mean, it's going into mm -hmm. your elbow is the way they keep it. Because that's not going to make much contact with anything else in the world. You know, we get it under our hand, then we grab objects, shake hands, these things. That's going to be more transmission. Let me see if I could turn this volume down. I know that we have some people that keep asking questions here. Uh, there's a little bit of delay on my system that I'm seeing here as uh, we're, we're seeing some different people that are asking here. Um, and we have more viewers joining us right now. But uh, so we're just talking about kids. Let's talk about really who this the coronavirus, the 2019 coronavirus is impacting. When we look at worldwide numbers, we're looking at the elderly. They're the ones that are, it seems, disproportionately being targeted, the ones in the deaths that are dealing with this. While younger people may be getting sick and dealing Dealing with a with a common cold, it's the elderly though that are the ones that are that seem to be dying more. Why is that? Well, so that's those statistics are exactly right, and we have the benefit of learning from China's experience because they're months ahead of us in terms of the where they are in their outbreak, and we've been able to put together studies and look at what's been happening in China, and that's going to give us advanced knowledge uh, for the outbreaks here. What we've seen is we talked about about a two to two point five percent right. risk of death if you get the infection, but that number is much much higher. Uh, and is disproportionately uh, reflected in the, the elderly population. Mm -hmm. If you're above 80, we've seen numbers of 15% of the cases end in death. If you're in the 70 to 80 range, you know, it's, it's, it's still elevated. Right. So the, the older you get, the more vulnerable you are. And that just speaks to the fact that all of our organs, um, even if we're not suffering from a, a true identifiable chronic health problem, do age along with us. And they're more vulnerable to this kind of insult. Uh, one of our one of our viewers, somebody that's watching right now, his name's John Smith. He wrote on here, John Price. I'm sorry. He said, um, "Are we blowing this out of proportion?" Why? He actually said, "Why are we blowing this out of proportion?" And that leads into the question, and John hopefully will be able to answer this. Compare this with influenza right now, where we're seeing an estimated anywhere every year, 16,000 people die in the U.S. from influenza, and there's vaccinations for that compared to what we're dealing with right now, where we're talking about 12 deaths in the U.S. and we can get up to 18,000 to 46,000 from influenza. So there's, there's very valuable comparisons to be made, and there's ways in which it is blown out of proportion. I'll give you the numbers that we have for this current season right now to start with with influenza, and this is in the U.S. We're talking about 30 million cases estimated of, of infection. Of those, approximately 300,000 end up in the hospital, and somewhere around 18,000 uh, this year have died from influenza-related illness. So much larger numbers in the aggregate. Right. Um, but what that points to, though, is that we... We don't want to add another respiratory infection on top of that. You don't get to choose whether you're going to get flu or, you know, COVID-19. One could one rolls the dice twice in a season right now. You're going to be exposed to flu and you may be exposed to uh, COVID-19 as well. So the last thing we want to do is see another equal uh, infection of equal magnitude layered on top of that. That certainly puts us all more at risk. If you're talking about 18,000 deaths, even if this turns out to be just just another flu, you'd be talking about adding another 18,000 deaths on top of that. So that's, there's reason to be concerned, even if it's just like flu. So there's reason to be concerned it's so much worse than flu, as some people are thinking. Right. But there would be reason to be concerned even if it were just another flu in the same season as flu. So that's, that's one way to think about it. Right. The other part of it is that it does look a little bit worse up front um, because our knowledge of it is imperfect by far. With, with flu, we're able to you know, go back to other seasons and, and make real forecasts and projections. Right. When you look at the numbers, I, I threw the word estimated in there because, in fact, it is estimated. But we're able to estimate it based on a, an extensive amount of past experience with the flu that we simply do not have with the coronavirus. So there's an element of the unknown. And in the early phases of testing and, and detecting a virus, all those tests are allocated more towards the more severe cases. So they disproportionately reflect the severe cases. They make us think that case by case it's more dangerous. But one of the things we learned, for instance, there was a 72,000 patient series that we studied in China, and out of that entire 72,000 set of cases, only 1% were asymptomatic. It makes it sound like it's almost always symptomatic. But at that time, there was not testing available to just go out and pan test everybody. Yeah. Um, 
What we saw in the Diamond Princess, where people were in a confined environment, mm -hmm. they actually did much more extensive testing among those individuals because their exposure was more substantial, and they found that the percentage of asymptomatic or without symptoms was more in the order of somewhere between 35 and 50 percent, and that may still undercall the amount of cases where there actually are no symptoms or no serious symptoms. Let's talk about this, uh, Doctor, and thank you so much. This is Dr. Ted Bailey. If you're just joining us right now on Facebook here and you're finding out, and people have been posting questions here, um, we're talking more about coronavirus and, and COVID-19 here and how it impacts people here, particularly in Maryland, but also going worldwide. Um, you are infectious disease chief there. So we're talking about influenza versus COVID-19. And when we talk about more mortality rates here, mm -hmm. let's let's talk a little bit because people are arguing, saying, you know what, this actually is showing a much more higher death rate because the smaller numbers, we're talking 100,000 impacted worldwide and uh, 236 in the U.S. where we have 12 deaths versus influenza where we're talking about, as you were just saying, in the millions, even though we're seeing 16,000. So when you look at the ratio, this actually is a higher death rate. Is that true? Well. Again, it's too early to, to accurately calculate that, that, that ratio, that, that death rate for infections, because we haven't, in, in particular in the U.S., our strategy has not been to roll out testing and just fan out into the neighborhoods and just test people to understand whether they have or don't have it. We've been reserving our tests for people who have clear symptoms, but that's already skewing the results, because you're going to, if you test only people with symptoms, it'll look like 100% of the people with the infection have symptoms. Gotcha. Right, but if you were to, as the way South Korea has gone out and really tested more people, their death rate's much lower. It doesn't reflect better biomedical technology. It doesn't reflect better better hospital management. It reflects the fact that they've captured more of the milder or even without symptoms cases. Let's talk about what happens though, um, and we've been getting a lot of people talking about the traveling. We'll come back to that. He already answered some of that, and, but I'll get back to your questions here. Also, here um, Jack Atkins here talking about uh, local testing to be accurate. Can we count on that? that local testing, can that be accurate? It can be, but we're so early into it, we're not entirely sure how good it will be. And I will say that there are multiple test platforms being developed in real time. There's clearly a need for it in the U.S. and globally. Um, and so there's attempts to develop better mousetraps, better testing. And we won't really know how good our testing is uh, at the outset. Uh, is it missing some cases? Uh, is, it, is it detecting things that are not the actual coronavirus? Okay. Um, we're doing our best, but we know that over time tests have imperfections, both in terms of catching things that are not the real thing, the right. so-called false positives, but also missing things that really are the thing you're looking for, so-called false negatives. And we're not entirely sure how perfect our tests are at this well, point. The false negatives and just the testing and just the fact that the media seems to be talking about coronavirus all the time now, is that creating also health concerns for anxiety, not just the, the physical and the emotional, but the um, psychological then drama that may be added to this? I think that's inescapable. If you if you see about it, the, the implication is what they're talking about, it must be different. And, it must be different in some radical way. I mean, we're not talking about the flu. Flu must be okay, but we've talked about that those statistics are quite large. 18,000 deaths so far this season from the flu. Far fewer, really, so far worldwide um, from the coronavirus. So, um, but we don't hear about the flu. So it puts us at ease. It gives us a sense that we're on top of it, we're familiar with it, we know what we're doing with it. But when something is trumpeted throughout, you know, a 24 hour news cycle, right. uh, you, it is natural to think that it must be radically different when, in fact, it really is the novelty of it, but ultimately it will be something that's that's like other viruses that we've dealt with. Caitlin asked a great question. Um, she was saying, do you know what, if you are, um, if you have the flu vaccine, will that help you at all dealing with the coronavirus? Do they transfer over or viral? Um, when we're talking about vaccinations, mm -hmm. then mm -hmm. are, are they too specific where it won't help you? So I'm gonna answer it that way, and then I'm gonna broaden the question a little bit if I may. Okay. For, the way you put it, it will not help you with Corona-19, with, okay. with this new COVID-19. Um, the, the viruses are in totally different families, and they have totally different molecular structures. The vaccine gets your immune system ready to recognize that molecular structure of the thing you've been vaccinated against. So, so and we have to change it every year for the flu anyway. The, the flu itself changes, and our vaccine yes. becomes outdated, and we do the next vaccine the next year. Um, but there's nothing relevantly similar between the two viruses for the flu vaccine to protect us against it. But what I would say is, you can either go into this season protected to the extent that we can against the flu and still being not protected against corona, or you can go into it not protected against either. You have a choice. And so if you're, if you're facing two hazards and you can protect yourself against one of them, you're gonna, right. you have a much better prospect of staying healthy between now okay. and next year. I want to catch everyone up real quick. You can take me on one real quick here. Uh, I want to uh, let you know exactly what we're talking about here. We've been watching the Johns Hopkins website that shows you exactly how many people are, are impacted right now with the 
COVID-19 or coronavirus. I'm joined by GBMC's doctor, though, Ted Bailey here, who is the chief of infectious disease there at that uh, location. And we've been talking about the numbers, what this means for here in Maryland. We just heard from the health department in Montgomery County where we have a couple in their 70s and a 50-year-old woman that were all on a cruise ship that are now confirmed cases here. We have 31 total, three we know confirmed cases of the coronavirus here in Montgomery, uh, Montgomery County in Maryland, but they are no, and let me reiterate this, Dr. Travis Gale said this, to ease anxieties that are going on here. He said this repeatedly, no community transmission, it's all travel related. We know that that cruise ship, we found out also here at Fox 45, that cruise ship never docked in Baltimore, but they traveled here and that the medical staff, even though they just mentioned it this morning here, just at uh, 10 o'clock this morning, they have been dealing with this for a couple days now, making sure they track down anyone they came in contact with. Uh, Dr. Bailey here has also been talking about this is not an airborne. That's another reason, and a lot of people have been writing that, if I travel or not. This is not airborne. This is a droplet that has to go into your system somehow. Well, those, those overlap. Um, and I, I would actually caution about not saying it's airborne. Okay. Um, certainly, we believe that the major mechanism is going to be respiratory droplets, but the difference between airborne and, and, and droplet is actually a matter of size. Um, both of these are expelled from the respiratory tract, but it's a, it's a question of size. We're talking about things that are greater or smaller than 60 micrometers or microns. If it's greater than 60 microns, it's heavy enough that it acts just like a, a tennis ball. As it comes out, gravity takes it and it drops. Yep. And the range is approximately 4 to 4.5 feet. You know, so if you're outside that range, it's just not going anywhere. When you get down below 60 microns in size, then the air can buffer it and it can actually drift Best, around a bit. Right? And we're not sure. We believe that some part of transmission may be with the airborne component, which is why in hospitals we do recommend that we use airborne precautions as well as droplet precautions um, for this. So, so at this point, that's, I, I, would, I would keep those both as open possibilities. Okay. Um, and we also, again, contact. Don't forget that you want to throw contact into it, too. Because if you really focus on the respiratory only, then there's a sense that if I can just get the mask on and, and, and worry about that, everything else will take care of itself. But we really, you can pick it up from surfaces and then get it onto yourself later on when the mask is down and you're feeding yourself. We keep going back to a lot of physicians out here talking about washing your hands, humming happy birthday song twice in order to accurately go mm -hmm. through hand washing with soap and water is the, the number one best way to do that. One other thing though, when you were just talking about that possibility with the size of the droplets, what about air travel then? I mean, we're talking about cruise ships and we've been talking about mm -hmm. the testing they've done there, but if I were to get on a plane with, some, with a whole lot of strangers that are coming in from who knows where, and I'm spending three to four hours breathing in that same air. We don't know the length of how long this virus will last. Well, we know on surfaces it can last longer. How long might it last in the air if yep. it's in the smaller drops? That's not, I would not be able to knowledgeably predict that. But what I would say is, and this is the way to think about safety mechanisms in general. Radars do not protect all airplanes. We have crashes. Seatbelts don't protect all restrained passengers. So we shouldn't really create a fine line between either technologies that perfectly protect us and things that are imperfect and just push those aside. Okay. So, you know, if a mask does not eliminate all of the potential small uh, droplets, doesn't it completely eliminate our risk, it may still substantially if, you know, protect us. And, you know, in the hospital setting where we're dealing with patients who have symptoms, in a, in a physician's office that may not have the highest tech, we would still recommend that if they can't get the respirators, the higher tech protection. The N95s. The I mean, N95s. Those are the ones that are very expensive masks. They're street, hard to come by. Very hard to come by. And that's something where they're smaller versus that little 30 cent mask that we have that has that little tiny aluminum foil. We, we've been hearing, though, that that may actually hinder this. Is people wearing that improperly or keeping it on too well, long, you actually may get germs and get sick from something else. It, but the people that are showing signs, it would be better for them to wear it if they're out in public. So any protective technology has to be used correctly. If you read yeah. your radar wrong, if you're, if you're applying your seatbelt incorrectly, it's not going to protect you or not going to protect you as well. So, so with any of these technologies, it's important to make sure that you're applying it correctly. With, the, with respirators, the additional benefit that they provide is the tightness of their seal. But if you're not fit tested, which means that you've been checked in, to find out what size fits you, right. um, you might as well not be, it's not going to provide you all the protection that it could. Uh, so let's talk about the mask then, particularly here. So we're, we're the little cheap ones. Is it worth us going out and buying them, even if you can find them, and wearing a mask at any point if you're nervous about it, if you do have to fly, would that help you at all? 
I, I honestly feel it is too early to say for sure what its impact would be. Um, you know, in, in a low-risk environment, it's probably of no additional benefit. But in a, we, we, I can just tell you honestly that we would be using them in hospital settings. Okay. You know, now that's not representative of normal interpersonal interactions. You know, we're in there, we're looking very closely, we're examining a patient who's in the hospital or the ER with symptoms. You know, we have a kind of proximity and interaction with them that it does not reflect what other people might be doing just outside the hospital. Okay. So in those really high risk situations, we certainly use it. We don't know how it translates out into other environments, and, but once again, it would depend on accuracy or adequacy of use, it's being applied correctly. Uh, Alice Lambert has written in here, she says, uh, it can be dormant 14 days or more, wash your hands, cough in your elbow sleeve, as you've been saying here multiple times, wipe your surfaces at home, but do we know if it can be dormant for 14, um, 14 days or more? We, we, we do not know that. I think what she's actually talking about, if I was, to, if I'm going to alter the question a little bit, yeah. is incubation time, which neither you nor I have right. talked about yet. So we do believe that the incubation time, that's the time from when you're exposed yep. to when you develop symptoms, ranges between two to 14 days. And there's, there's been outliers, there's been cases where it seems like the exposure was maybe 24 days earlier before onset of symptoms, mm -hmm. but those are so rare that it's actually believed that what, that the suspected exposure was not the moment that the infection happened and that it was an another moment later on that the person actually was exposed. So, okay. so the, the really the more reliable range seems to be two to 14 days. Um, and we know that some people aren't gonna have symptoms. Right, um, oh, I mean, that's what we were saying though. Majority of the people may actually have it, but that lies in the next step of this. So if I am, if I am not feeling anything, but I may have been exposed, and I don't know this, depending on how much time, if I go home and I go to visit my parents, my father has gone through cancer chemo treatment, his immune system is compromised right there. He's elderly, so right there, I may not know it, but then I may actually touch my eyes, sneeze, whatever, on a surface there where he may be sitting. And that's, I think, what is the real danger here, more than just me as a middle-aged man who's mm -hmm. healthy and may get a little sniffle for a couple days. But that shouldn't be a game changer because that, that, that immune-suppressed relative of ours is not only vulnerable to COVID-19. This isn't something new to 2020. Great point. They're vulnerable yep. to flu. They're vulnerable to many other things. So really, already we're familiar with that issue and, and, and family members around those folks often should be more protective. And they, and they themselves often will be instructed as, as a particularly vulnerable individual sometimes to have masks as they go around. People on chemotherapy, people on medicine because of uh, organ transplants, they're often instructed to take heightened precautions. And those same precautions would translate into this, this epidemic. Uh, people have been talking here on Facebook too about um, just saying, okay, keep, we keep hearing more about travel. But before we answer your questions on travel here, uh, I wanna talk about a little bit of when we are infected, and we do, um, I guess, get a cold, whether we get tested for coronavirus 2019, COVID-19 or not, then how, the next time this comes around, will we be more susceptible for it or will we, our immunity will be built up then as a healthy individual? And whatever happened, and kind of dovetailing on that, whatever happened with MERS and SARS then? I mean, it kind of mm -hmm. seems like it's gone away. I mean, there's a lot of these coronaviruses. It seems like even though they're still out there, they kind of just, it's not the big deal anymore. Well, that's right. The SARS-1 really did seem to fade away um, in ways that would suggest immunity, but are not, is not proof of that as a concept. MERS was never that contagious to start with. It's much less contagious um, than the flu, than either of these SARS viruses, uh, but it was much more deadly when you got it. It had a case fatality rate of about 30%. Uh, so why? It's not just... I can't promise that there's lasting immunity. The viruses do mutate. I mean, mm -hmm. One of the reasons why we go season to season with the flu is because of significant genetic changes in the virus over time, and so that our immunity to the previous one does not carry over to the next one. And we can't predict at this point what the mutations will be like in this virus, whether we will, by being exposed to it, yeah. develop immunity that would then carry forward into the future. Okay. Courtney asked, um, let's get to the next phase then. Say if I do come back, my test comes back positive and I have coronavirus, um, I get contact. What happens to me as an individual or a family member? What do you do if you now you know that a patient has come back and the test is positive? Well, since there isn't, so for some kinds of infections, if somebody is exposed, known to be exposed, there's a particular treatment that you might give them. Uh, if you're a household contact of someone who's known to have the flu, you might actually take Tamiflu. It's actually known, and we use it in high risk, you know, if there's a pregnant woman in the house, high risk individual, they may go on to Tamiflu to help prevent acquiring the flu virus. Right. Um, in some cases, you might start to vaccinate 
uh, people who are in close proximity. Um, but in this case, we don't have a vaccine and we don't have a, a medication that would reduce the risk of it yourself. So there isn't anything specifically to do medically. Um, and that's true for most viruses. This is one of the things, again, that's not exceptional uh, to COVID-19, is that we have to just manage it symptomatically. So if you've been exposed, there is a chance that you'll acquire it. You should do the things that can reduce that mm -hmm. risk as much as possible. Um, and then monitor yourself for symptoms. And, and again, show hygiene as well if you develop symptoms. Not going out unnecessarily, you know, not, so if you're sick, you know, right. I, I mean, I think that there should be non-punitive, uh, you know, sick day policies because that's the kind of thing that can drive people into more concentrated settings um, and lead to it. But if you're able to stay home, you know, limit yourself, which we would do for other illnesses, nothing exceptional still, um, that's going to be beneficial. Um, I, it's, it's really drawing on the wisdom that we've accumulated over dealing with lots of other respiratory illnesses, which for a lot of them, there's always some fraction that are serious. And I want to talk about that because I'm seeing some comments here. People are saying, you know, um, Sierra is saying, well, there's no treatment. There's not, nobody knows what they're doing yet. They still have no idea. Um, Carl T. Tobol writing that there. And I understand your point there. It sounds like that. But what you're saying, though, is you've dealt with other viruses in the past, infectious disease. You've dealt with this. For viral things, really, there's not much unless you have vaccine. There's nothing That's to do. Bacteria, we could pop a pill and fight that. Um, and there's lots of those. But common colds, viral things, there is nothing you do except for keep yourself away because it's viral. Until they build a vaccine, there's absolutely nothing we can do. That's right. The, it's the exception, not the rule, yeah. that for viral illnesses, we have treatments. The exceptions are few. Yeah. Flu is one of them. HIV is one of the successful ones, hepatitis C. But for the respiratory viruses, the very vast majority of them, there is no treatment except what we call supportive care. But that's not nothing, right? So that yeah. if people develop more, you know, more severe illnesses, they need supplemental oxygen, well, we know how to give it to them. If they develop you know, issues with their heart, we know how to monitor those. If, so as organs have problems in the course of an acute infection, we manage and support that organ system and, and the patient as a whole and get them through it so that they can convalesce. That's, that's, we wouldn't be doing anything different for the lungs of, of a patient who's having problems from this as from, say, a severe flu. I mean, um, or a, another severe respiratory virus. Um, and I, are you okay with time? I know it's, uh, it's been a half hour now that you've been here with us. So you're very important. And Ted Bailey here is also with GBMC, again, lending us some time here for this Facebook feedback here that we're talking about, getting your questions and concerns. So we appreciate the questions. Keep coming in. I'm, I'm trying to keep up with them. They're coming in a lot here, though, and, uh, and answer those questions. Do you have a couple more minutes? Just oh, sure. With us? Okay. Yes. We've been talking about it, so I kind of want to go back to the symptoms now. As you're taking a look at Johns Hopkins' website, that's what we've been showing you every once in a while. That shows the United States at 236, coronavirus, the 2019 coronavirus, one of seven coronaviruses that are active right now that we know about, 236 um, have confirmed cases here in the United States. Now, there are active cases also in Asia. We're talking about over 100,000 people worldwide, but that number, that red number drops down when we talk about active cases because people have gone through two weeks, fought the cold, and are now not, not actually spreading it anymore. Mm -hmm. Similar to the way that you talked about SARS and MERS here. Mm -hmm. um, so when we go back here, talking about the symptoms. So if I were to go over those, if you're just joining us here on this Facebook post, let's talk about the symptoms here and how that relates to, as you just see, the influenza or the flu versus the coronavirus. Well, so one of the things, and. Again, focusing on the fact that some other respiratory illnesses can have a small fraction of severe cases. But the, 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 common, the common symptoms here, whether it's going to become severe or not, tend to be fever. As I said, 95% or more cases have fever as a part of them, which distinguishes them from a lot of other respiratory viruses, right. but not the flu. Um, then we also get cough. The cough tends to be dry. So, you know, with, uh, with bacterial pneumonias and these things, we tend to have a more productive cough. This seems to be uh, a dry cough. We have aches. You know, that's something we associate with flu-like symptoms, so there's an achiness to it, um, there's fatigue. And this is why it's very important. When you go in to see your health care provider, you actually go through all those things. When a nurse or a, an MA or somebody talks mm -hmm. to you and they ask you, okay, height, weight, they take your blood pressure, then they start asking you questions before you maybe even see your physician or your provider. Mm -hmm. They start asking these questions. It's important to say, yeah, I am achy, and to kind of run through that whole thing. That's why they ask those same questions. Because it allows us to differentiate different kinds of syndromes. For instance, with, with the corona, we don't see as much of the, and in fact, hardly any uh, nasal congestion, sore throat. These are the things that we would associate with adenovirus or with, yes. uh, with, the, with the rhinovirus, with the more common colds. Um, and it would help us to know that about a patient. So a, a responsible clinician or nurse, but also a patient, you know, should be really assessing that, that list. 
and, and it helps us differentiate it. Yeah. Um, what I would say, just as a, as a, so those are the symptoms that are there at present. The symptom that starts to appear, that starts to hint that this will be one of the more severe cases rather than the milder ones is a real shortness of breath. This tends to develop around day five of illness. It's not typically present right at the beginning, but it seems that in the, in the, in the minority of cases where this becomes severe, um, there's a development of shortness of breath. Um, and, and that is something that then hints, it's never, it's never a perfect clue, that this may be going down that track instead. And that's the kind of symptom that, that really would warrant contacting your physician and saying, you know, I've had this go on for a couple of days, it wasn't too bad, but I'm starting to develop this new symptom, uh, and what should I do? Now, not everyone in the community has a primary care doctor, so that's an important thing to recognize. So what else can we do about it? Well, Maryland has set up a hotline. So it's 211, and there's, there's just some access to that. But if you don't have that and, you, and you're not accessing the hotline, certainly uh, you know, calling uh, a hospital is, is something to think about with the development of shortness of breath. Okay. Shortness of breath because this is the coronavirus, the 2019 coronavirus is respiratory impacting um, right there. So uh, then let's, I want to kind of um, end this here a little bit. We've gotten a lot of questions here and um, a lot of people are talking about just exactly what this means. They don't even really want you in the hospitals. Uh, we had that Sierra River says, saying that, yeah, that's right. That's why they're taking you to certain areas for quarantine or staying at home actually would be better protection there. Run the course of those. Mm -hmm. But let's talk about the, the level of um, anxiety here. Uh, we heard it earlier, Dr. Travis Gales in Montgomery County, he's at the emergency uh, management. He said, we really need to calm down. So when you look at this and you're looking at it, he said, this is not, a lot of people are saying, yeah, but it's spreading everywhere. It's going to eventually come here. It's going to spread to everybody. This is going to happen. How do you relate that when you hear that and people are watching this or writing in on Facebook, you're looking at the comments on the side. We don't know if they're even physicians at all, but people are writing certain things on the side of these and they're saying things that may contradict what you're saying. You, you've done this. You've dealt with infectious disease. You are the chief infectious disease from GBMC. What, how do you kind of calm people's nerves that are out there that are like, who do we trust? Who do we listen to? For me, and if I, if I can have a moment for a, a bit of a metaphor, there's a, there's a, I'm from Indiana, in full disclosure, there's a wonderful movement in the movie Hoosiers where Gene Hackman walks his team, they're about to play for the state championship, but they've been playing basketball for years, but they're going on to a new stage, and he, and he simply walks them through the court and says, look, it's the same size, it's the same dimensions. So we do deal with other viruses that, that, that claim lives, 18,000 deaths so far from flu. Um, that's even with vaccination yeah. and even with treatment. So even with those things making it less, that's where we are. So we're used to sort of having, we know that there's a large number of mild flu. And in individuals who remain mild, there's nothing to be gained from those individuals coming in and being admitted into a hospital, going through an ER. If flu, although it can kill people and does kill people and does it every year, if it's still mild, there's no additional advantage necessarily to coming in. And that's true for other respiratory illnesses. Um, so, you know, someone could call in, they have flu-like symptoms, the, pr the primary care doctor could prescribe Tamiflu, but there isn't over and above that anything else to do. And for COVID-19, we don't have Tamiflu. So there isn't something to be gained at the early onset from coming in and, and accessing the healthcare system. We are, and I just emphasize the familiarity of that. We, for many other viruses, that's the, that's the deciding line, that's but the dividing when I, line. When I show up at certain buildings and I hear sporting events are being canceled, there's, I mean, should we be, and you know, Italy right now, there, you can't watch the professional games because they don't want too many people in that close proximity together. Or you show up at a, uh, at a provider around here and you mm -hmm. see a sign, hey, if you have these symptoms, stay outside, don't come into the facility, we'll come out and have you questions, which we've seen before though. But, so that begs the question, uh, is that rational, right? right? So every year, we have a gigantic flu season. It's seasonal. And during that period, people have it and they're transmitting it. But the question to you is between September and March, the kind of the peak months of, of flu, which again, this season, we're talking about 30 million cases, 300,000 hospitalizations and 18 million deaths. Have we shut down um, sporting events? Did we? Did we close the Super Bowl because of the flu? Despite the magnitude of it? And the answer is absolutely not. So we are familiar with giant magnitude viral epidemics that spread across the world. Um, and yet we've, we've, we've become, and I think rational, we've become rational about how we deal with flu. We've become accustomed to it. Our rationality is improved by familiarity, but the, the scope of what we're seeing here is not out of proportion with flu. And, and uh, the same playbook uh, would be appropriate for it. Okay.
So there, the questions that we're getting here, a lot of similar questions that you would get for the flu, exactly the same as what you can, you just answered right there. When you compare it with influenza, the magnitude there, it kind of puts it in perspective where we are with Corona 2019 or COVID-19. Okay. Doctor, thank you so much. We appreciate sure. your time. Uh, we really appreciate the questions, the comments also on Facebook. And uh, again, I want to thank uh, Dr. Ted Bailey here with GBMC. He is the chief infectious disease. So you are the professional. You've been doing this for a while. You actually, just to kind of a little side note here to let everyone know on Facebook you, when I said Dr. Travis Gales you said oh well no way I went to med school with him I, we grew up we I know him yeah and he's down in Montgomery County mm -hmm. also dealing with the exact same issues you are today so uh, there is a small community here of professionals that have been dealing with this for generations decades you personally here have been dealing with it so uh, we just love to have the uh, the input here coming from somebody the number one thing wash your hands and uh, treat it just like any other disease any other viral disease if somebody's infected most of them will be mild so it, it really is about Case by case, is this severe? Is this something where medical support is necessary? Most times it is not. All right. Dr. Bailey, thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much for joining us also on Facebook. We'll see you here tonight on Fox 45. Actually, we'll get to see you there at 4, 5, and 6.